I think one of the um, one of the big uh, issues that are affecting the world today is that there is a lot of talk about wellness and about healthy eating and all that sort of stuff. That's that's a big discussion. And even in the church, where we have the word of wisdom, we've had the word of wisdom for over 150 years, we're having those discussions, um, and uh, and it's become a hot topic. Um, but I think sometimes we are relying too much on the secular and not enough on the spiritual in regard to, to uh, where, those con where those conversations are going. Mm -hmm. So that's what, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the, the, the key elements of, of the human being, which is the brain, or the mind, the heart, the body, and the spirit. Um, and these elements are the key things that deal with all of the challenges of life. We're going to affect one of those four areas. Um, and the way that God has put us all together, He has built within us innate abilities to be able to deal with stresses and pressures and everything else that this life is, throws at us, that we can tap into that. But if you think about it, a loving God would not send His children to this earth knowing full well of all of the vagaries, the challenges of life that they will face, without giving us the ability to do that. Okay. Um, you will not hear me say in this, comp in this uh, presentation that you should not, medical intervention is, 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 not, is uh, bogus. I'm not ever going to say that. But what I am going to say is that there are a lot of things that God has given us that might mean that we don't need medical intervention if we were to harness those things and, and apply them. Okay. So that's what we're going to talk about. So it all comes down to... to the first and great commandment, in my opinion. The first and great commandment, as we all know, is to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul. The Doctrine and Covenants define soul to mean spirit and body, and with all of our mind, or I'm going to call that the brain. All right. So these are your key elements. The brain, the heart, the spirit, and the body. Now, for many uh, Polynesians, Māori and Pacific, they understand this concept, or at least the ancestors did, that when a person was sick, it wasn't necessarily a physiological uh, problem. It could be a spiritual problem. It could be an environmental problem. It could be a problem within the tribe. They understood that a person wasn't just the individual that was part of everything around them, and that you needed to get everything aligned to, to deal with the physiological problem. But in modern science today, if you exhibit a physiological problem, they give you a pill to deal with the physiological problem, not necessarily trying to understand whether it's a spiritual issue, an emotional issue, or a bodily issue. Okay? And, and you can see that science in the way that World Health Organization define mental health. They define it physical, that's the body. They define it as mental, that's the brain. And they define it as social. Okay, that's probably the heart. What's missing? That's right. That's what's missing. And that's part of the problem with some modern uh, physicians, that they don't have this part or take that into consideration in their prognosis um, of an individual. And that's a critical part because a person's spiritual malay will also exhibit itself in a physiological fashion, um, as will all of these others. So, um, I'm going to put up these, uh, when I go to the gym, um, and I don't say that to show off, I'm just, when I go to the gym, I see these little things written on the, on the, on the mirrors. <laughs> and these little sayings, some people write on the mirrors, and people look at them and they go, only the easy day was yesterday, <laughs> and they start working out, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, some people read these things, and it motivates them to, to go harder. Mm. Other people read them and go, yeah, it's okay for that guy, but look at me. You know. And it, it, is, it demotivates them. And, and you know, it's the same as the half cup is half full or the cup is half empty. And so, it's, why, are those, why are there those different responses to the same thing? And, and that's, that's what we're going to try, try and look at. Now, I want to do it this way. I'm going to use the tree of life experiments to, to explain how this all works. So that's the, the, the great and spacious buildings. Okay? <laughs> and then this is, this is us. Here we are. 
That's our heart, brain, our body, and our spirit. That's our emotional, our mental, our physiological, and our spiritual. That's what makes us up. These are the key elements of us. We've got this great spacious building over here, and let's see what that does. Okay. The great spacious building, one of the things that we can't change what's happening in that building. All right? These are what I call the facts of life. One of the facts of life is, as scriptures tell us, there must be opposition in all things. All right? So we can't just say, hey, God, this ain't fear. Hold on. I already told you. There's got to be opposition in all things. But you know what? I've built inside you things that you can use to deal with the opposition. You just need to understand how to draw upon those, the, the, those innate abilities. That will also affect these areas of us, uh, um, of these elements, if we allow it to, and will overcome us if we allow it to. John 16.33, the Saviour speaking to the Apostles. This is the end of his leadership training conference and the Last Supper in the upper room prior to the most important thing he was going to do, atone and die for the world. And the last thing he said in that meeting was verse, six, verse 33. And he says, These things I have said unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In this world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So what he was teaching them, the last nugget of knowledge was, Hey, the world that you live in, tribulation, great spacious building. Can't change that. With me, you will find peace. You will never find peace in the world. No matter how you, where you sit, no matter what you achieve, no matter what success you think you're going to get, you will never find true peace. That comes only through Christ. But this is the secret. I have learned how to overcome the world. And if he's learned how to overcome the world, we too can learn how to overcome the world. So he says, be of good cheer, be positive, be, uh, uh, be hopeful. To learn that. That's, that was the last nugget from that leadership training that he gave us, he gave the brethren. Important nugget. And then we have this other one. Doctor, I mean, uh, 1 Corinthians. It tells us that we will not be tempted beyond our ability to, to uh, withstand. I've changed the word tempted to tested. I like that better than tempted. That we will not be tested beyond our ability to respond. Okay? So that's another fact that. There is never going to be a test that we will experience that we do not have the ability to withstand or to overcome. Um, so some people say, oh, this is just too much. I just go and do it. No. He says, no, you, no, you, no, you've got the ability to withstand any test. Uh, may not be, you may not, it may not be an exciting thing, but you have the ability to withstand it. So that's another fact. Another fact of life. Doctrine and Covenants 89, which is the Word of Wisdom section, it talks about evils and designs in the world today and the hearts of conspiring men. And those are the things that we see that flash up before us telling us, hey, come over here and do this. This will make you happy. Hey, come out and change your lifestyle and do this. this will, eat this, this is going to make you really happy. <laughs> you know, that's the conspiring men. You know, they, back in the, in the olden days, cigarette smoking, that was advertised as being healthy, as being, you know, popular, mm. as being feminine, cool. and being masculine. And now look at it. It's, you, you know, Goodness. rotten teeth and everything else. But that was, <laughs> that was the conspiring hearts of men, teaching us things to do things that ultimately were not good for us. That, that exists. Um, another one I haven't got up there is uh, Christ taught that uh, the, sun, the rain falls upon the wicked and the, and the righteous, the sun rises upon uh, the good and the bad. All right, which means just because you're righteous doesn't mean you're always going to have sunshine. And just because you're wicked it doesn't always mean you're going to have rain. All right, that's a fact. We can't change that. So when the neighbour goes out on Sunday with his 700 foot uh, launch to go fishing, and you go in your little Toyota to church, and you're wondering who's being blessed, ah, rain, sun, nothing. Don't worry about it. All right, and, that, and we can get rid of a lot of anxiety. <laughs> I understand at that point. You don't need to worry about it. You know, they're probably going to rain on the boat anyway when they're out there. You know, so, so, so this is, and and this is how the Lord can strengthen us, in dealing with the, the facts of life of the of the um, of a great and spacious building. That's the, that's the tree of life. Section one twenty one. 
Then shall thy confidence wax strong in the presence of God. If you look at section 21, um, about verses 33 onwards, on your left hand side, you know, the page is divided in half. On your left hand column, it talks about all the things that, that you should not do. You know, no power of influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood. Blah, 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 blah. Boom. Then on the right hand column of that same page, it then talks about all the good things. You know, uh, faith, virtue, uh, and uh, love and fame, and charity, and diligence, and all that sort of stuff, which are greatly enlarged the soul. All of that's on the right hand side. And when you've done all of that stuff on the right hand side, then it concludes with this. Then shall thy confidence wax strong in the presence of God. Or in other words, I take confidence to mean then shall thy resilience to the things of the world be strong in the presence of God. So God gives you, has given us the ability to be resilient. He calls confidence if we do the things on the right-hand column and don't do the things on the left-hand column. Okay? And the right-hand column is basically loving God with your heart, mind, mind, and strength. Okay, that's what it's, that's essentially putting that in, in a basic term. Um, right. so, yeah. uh, so, let's start looking at these elements, heart, mind, mind and, heart, mind, and uh, spirit and body. So, heart, thoughts, feelings, actions. Our mind generally drives our actions. You generally think about something before you actually do it. It's very rare not to think about something and, and do it. Okay, some children you think, oh, were you thinking when you did that? You know, sometimes that might happen, but the, the reality is, is that your thoughts generally drive your feelings and then drive your actions. And with the action as, as a positive action, then it reinforces the thought. And you say, like, okay, I, I need to do that again. If the action doesn't provide a positive re response back, you go, ooh, that's something I shouldn't do. There are some people that don't care, and they'll do it again. And they're normally the ones that end up in prison for a long time. All right, they don't they don't have that sort of reinforcement. But that's that's sort of the very basic model: thoughts drive things. In a in a legal sense, we have this thing called mens rea and actus rea. Actus rea is the act; it's Latin, is the act of doing something. And for a person to be committed, to, for a person to be found guilty of a crime, there must be the act, and there must be the mens rea or the intent. Mm -hmm. So they must have intended to do that. Or they must have, or they should have known that what they were doing would result in that. All right. If you cannot prove mens rea and actus reus, you will not get a conviction. Okay. And so again, it's talking about the mind driving the actions. You cannot. It doesn't go the other way. Okay. And 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 so, God understands all of that. We're going to talk about the mind. I'm going to show you this little clip here, Dr. Alia Crum. And she's going to talk to you a little bit about this thing called mindset. You see, the way we see the world is not is influenced less about from our environment, but more by the way our mind sees the world. We see the world, and that's our new reality. I'll give you an example. If I was to show a picture on here of a large intersection with lots of buildings, cafes, and so forth, and it's thousands of people crossing pedestrian uh, crossings and cars and everything else. And I were to show that picture to a fashion consultant. What they would see is what are people wearing? Fashion faux pas. And that would be what they see because that's their reality. I show that to an anti terrorist cop. He will see mm, that's suspicious behavior. Uh, well, they look dodgy, those people there. That's what he will see because that's his reality. Right? If I was to show that to a mathematician, he or she would be looking at that and probably calculating how many people are crossing the road, and if that went on for 24 hours, what would be the total number of people crossing the road? <laughs> because again, that's their reality. What we see is what our brain determines as being our reality. And we see things that our brain has been, that we have uh, accustomed our brain to see. So we won't see the suspicious people because that's what we're not trained or accustomed our brain to think that way. Okay? So the way our brain thinks and sees things is the way that we see work, the, the world. That's our reality. And it's not, obviously, it's going to be different from person to person. And so the power of the brain is incredible. Let me show you this little clip here. Dr. Fabrizio Benedetti and his colleagues studied a, a group of patients undergoing thoracic surgery. Now what you should know about thoracic surgery 
is that it's a very invasive procedure. Patients are put under anesthesia while the surgeons make major incisions into the muscles of the sides and the back in order to gain access to their heart and to their lungs. Now about an hour after the anesthesia fades away, the pain starts to set in. Fortunately, patients are given strong doses of morphine sulfate, a powerful painkiller. This is re routine treatment for thoracic surgery, but Dr. Benedetti and his colleagues made a few subtle tweaks. Half of the patients were given the dose of morphine by a doctor at their bedside. The other half was given the exact same dose of morphine, but it was administered into their IV by a pre-programmed pump. Now you would think that both of these groups of patients would experience the same relief, but this was not the case. The group that received the morphine by the doctor reported significant reductions in their pain levels. The other group, the group who received the same exact amount of morphine but wasn't aware of it, they didn't seem to experience the same benefit. So Dr. Benedetti and his colleagues didn't stop there. They used the same procedure to test the effectiveness of other treatments. Treatments for anxiety, treatments for Parkinson's disease, treatments for hypertension. And what they found was remarkable and consistent. When the patients were aware of the treatment and expected to receive the benefit, the, the treatment was highly effective. But when they weren't, that same drug, that same pill, and that same procedure was blunted, and in some cases, not even effective at all. Interesting, isn't it? Um, she, oh. Dr. Fabrizio Benedetti. She, um, she, these are all on, on, on YouTube. You can find her on YouTube and watch the whole thing. It's really interesting. He, he talks about uh, two, two other experiments. One was um, they had uh, they, they had these office, oh, not office workers, uh, hotel workers, and they they noticed that the amount of effort the hotel workers put in the, the cleaning the clean the rooms and so forth, that the numbers of the amount of calories that they burned up in their daily routine was equivalent, in fact, was more than what, uh, what is recommended for, for, uh, for average activity for an individual. And so they, they, they were amazed by that. So they, they gathered a whole bunch of these people together from seven different hotels and asked them the question, do they, do they, have, do, they do regular exercise? And one third of them said no. Um, they, never, they never associated the exercise with what they were doing. And so what they then did was they split the group into two. And the first group, uh, the target group and the control group, the target group, they showed them a little video clip. And in the video clip, it talked to them about what they were doing and it showed them how many calories they were burning when they were doing this and when they were doing this and when they were doing this. It just showed them how many calories they were burning. And it said that if you continue to do that, you can expect to lose weight, you can expect to have uh, better blood pressure, and blah, 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 all the benefits. They then tested them all, you know, uh, weight and blood pressure, blah, 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 all of them. They didn't tell the, the other, the control group, the same stuff, so the control group didn't hear anything more. At the end of six months, they, they then retested them again. They found the, the, uh, the target group, all of their blood pressures, their weight and everything went down. And their job satisfaction through the roof. They found the other group, nothing had changed. Yet they were still doing the same work as the other group. Nothing had changed. Their blood pressure, nothing had changed. Because they did not expect the outcome. So the brain was set to expect these outcomes. Better blood pressure, lower weight, happier job satisfaction, blah, 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 blah. And so, they, so that became their new reality. And that was confirmed by the figures, which reaffirmed their reality. The other group, they weren't told that, so they weren't expecting it. So they didn't get any results, even though they were still doing the same thing. That's the power of the brain. I that, had a personal yeah. witness of that earlier this year with my dad. He's 19 years old, and he went into hospital for because um, he went in the night before, and they wouldn't operate because of his age and his condition. 
Um, and so that it, that, that, that it, it was resigned to us that night that he had three days to basically live. The next morning, um, and I think after all of the attention that the doctors and the nurses had given them the night before, the next morning I walked in and I thought, oh gosh, he's, he's really more alert today than what he was last night. And the surgeons picked that up as well. As a result of that, they then, we, we had a quick discussion, an hour later he went into a surgery for three hours. And this was someone who was pres presumably just left to die. Mm -hmm. um, what I found out in the recovery is the medication, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was the pain relief. And when the nurses were administering it and the doctor was there and he was explaining it, it was, it, you know, I saw my dad and he was taking it all in. In, in the ensuing um, recovery, they then had it where he pushed a button. He was given given a little thing to push the button to get the pain. So whenever he suffered pain, he just pushed this button. Well, he wouldn't. He wouldn't push that button. It had to take the nurse to come in and do that personal administration that made all the difference. And I'm going, oh my gosh. But is it because he's 90? But I learned, you know, that's why I learned yeah. the power of, of thinking, the power of the brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, yeah it, 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 it comes down to what you expect based upon what you what you learn or what you know. Yeah. And then your brain says, it's like what we call faith. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's you so expect why? that yeah. and it will happen. Yes. You know, you may not know what it is, but you expect that God's going to bless you. It will happen somewhere or another. Exactly. She, the, the other experiment that she did was they had um, they ha had these Harvard students come in and they had them um, taste this new milkshake and the and, and they had the all the info, all the ingredients in it and and how many calories and it was a healthy shake so it had very low calories and all the good stuff in it and um, and they then measured their what they call ghrelin which is uh, which is uh, in your stomach it's a gut and what it does is that when you're hungry ghrelin becomes active and it tells the brain you need to eat. All right, and so they measured the ghrelin uh, at the beginning, and then soon after they've eaten, they had had this milkshake, and many of them, the ghrelin came back pretty quickly, um, and they were said, "Oh, I need to eat again. I'm hungry." You know, they, they felt that. And so then they brought them back in again, and they gave them another milkshake, but this was a decadent milkshake. It had all the bad stuff in it, and multiple calories, and da 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 da, da. and they drank that, and they measured their ghrelin, and the ghrelin was satisfied. They need to eat. And then they told them that they were just drinking the same milkshake. Mm. <laughs> but you see, the brain saw that it was had all these calories, had all these baddie things in it, and the brain said, oh, hey, this, she's good. Drink that. She's good, but ain't any more. And the gremlin responded. But the other one was healthy, which meant, oh, hey, God, this is not going to fill me up. I'm going to need something else. The brain says, hey, boom. So, so it's amazing this thing that, that God's given us, this brain. Another example here, the history of the sub four minute mile. A famous New Zealander, John Walker, won the gold medal in 1976, Montreal, 1500 meters, and was a world record holder, held the, held the, held the record, record for the uh, sub four minute mile for a period of time. Well, let me show you this. It's July 17, 1945, a, um, uh, Swede, a Swede by the name of Hundahak. He held the world record for the mile, four minutes, 1.4 seconds. You see, the science at the time said that nobody was ever going to break the sub four minute mile. They said physiologically, it would damage you. They said the wind resistance, your body wasn't built for it. They said all of these things. Nobody, nobody, nobody would be able to break the four minute mile, okay? And so, for nine years, that record stood until somebody said, I don't agree with that. My brain says, I can break that. That's his new reality. Roger Bannister, 3 minutes 59.4 seconds, the first person to break the 4 minute mile and he didn't die. <laughs> All right? Nine years. How long did it take, how long do you think it took for somebody to break his record? 46 days. You see, once the brain realized that you can do this, other people said it was possible. John Landry from Australia, he broke that record 46 days later, 3 minutes 58 seconds flat. And now the record stands, I can't pronounce his name, 
from Algeria, 3 minutes 43.13 seconds, okay, 1999. You see, because the brain says that I can expect to do this, that becomes the person's new reality. It's just like faith. It's faith, it's exactly faith, but with the brain, okay? Um, Another, another great example of the power of the brain in, in having a, with regards to a bodily response. Now, as a man thinketh, so is in heart. So as we said, the brain uh, generally, you generally think things through the brain before your heart and your body follow. These are some ways in how we can retain a healthy brain, because up, obviously that's critical if we're going to continue to have uh, to draw upon the powers of the brain, we need to have a healthy brain. Um, and again, these are totally in line with what we teach in the gospel. Positive social connections. We need to mix with positive people. Of, of all the people on the earth today, the most positive people on the world, in the earth today should be members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, formerly called Mormons. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> that should be the most positive people upon the earth. But that's not always the case. But that's who should be the most positive people on the earth because of what we know. Our, our reality should be different to what the rest of the world is. So positive social connections builds positive habits. New learning. Our brain needs to be constantly active. That doesn't mean you've got to go to school every day. You need to, the brain needs to have new neural connections every day, learning something, developing something, doing something. And that continues to give the brain health. Diet. Oh yeah, here we go, the big one. Diet. We've got to get toxins out of the brain. All right. You'll, uh, the brain is two percent of the weight of our body. Of our total body, it only makes up two percent of the body mass weight-wise. But it consumes twenty to thirty percent of the calories that we bring into our body. So, if you want a smart brain, you eat smart food. If you want a dumb brain, you eat dumb food. All right. It's as simple as that. Because those calories, good or bad, the brain doesn't have a filter. It just takes whatever you bring in, and you bring bad stuff into your body, toxins and everything else, because it's going to slow the brain down, it's going to slow the blood to the brain, slows the, slows the actions of the brain. Um, uh, you know, so that's why when you eat and you're really full, and you just, you're sort of like a drunk person, because the brain is, it's a lot of blood flowing. The blood flow to the brain is, is reduced. So, diet, we've got the word of wisdom on that one. Good physical and spiritual health. So we need to be spiritually healthy and physically healthy. All right, and that will also mean we've got a healthy brain. Um, gratitude. A psychologist will tell you, write a gratitude journal. Write three things you're grateful for every day. Write them down. And when you start to feel that your glass is becoming half empty, you go back to your gratitude journal, you reread the things that you've written down, it re-energizes the brain, you're back on track again. Um, yeah, the gratitude journal, meditation, and we don't have to go up on a mountain and, and wear nappies and have our fingers go and start humming. Right? <laughs> meditation is ponderizing, or, or you know, it's it's pondering, it's finding a quiet moment. It's like Enos going out, having a quiet moment with the Lord. It's like Joseph Smith going to the grove of trees. It's all of that. It's just taking that time, going to the temple, having a quiet moment. That's meditation where the brain focuses on one thing and gets rid of everything else. Music. Music's another wonderful way to keep the brain active. Um, I was, in a, I was, in the, I was in the, at the airport one day, early morning flight, I was in the lounge getting me some food, and as I'm prone to do, I love to hum. Um, when I'm with people, when I'm by myself, I, love, I, I like to sing by myself. Uh, but when I'm with people, I'll, I'll hum songs. And, and I'm there filling up, playing, I'm always humming away. And then I'm just going over and I'm sitting down and there's a gentleman beside me whom I don't know and I'm humming away, I'm eating and humming and he looks over at me and he says, you're happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you see, we sometimes think um, we're, we're happy, uh, that, uh, that we, we sing because we're happy. But actually we're, we're happy because we sing. So if you're ever feeling down, start singing. And you'll start to hear that happiness level. You know, it's like the song, uh, it's like the sound of music. Remember when they got when the lightning and everything, they came in the kettles and water. They started singing, and the kids were happy again. They got rid of the fear. Music has that ability to rewire and rejig the brain. 
all right? And that person was picking up on my happiness, and it was affecting his happiness, okay? And that's how it can be infectious. Okay. Um, obviously, healthy anxiety is good. I'm going to talk about anxiety and stress. Anti-ants. Ants are automatic negative thoughts. We get a lot of automatic negative thoughts in our, in our brain. We'll be at work and, and we'll get a thought saying, Oh, the boss hates you. What? <laughs> what have I done? It's not even true. But we start to believe it. We give it, we give it the root in our mind and we mull over it. And then, oh, you're driving home and the thought comes, Oh, my wife doesn't love me. What? <laughs> Of course she does, but we allow those negative thoughts, if we allow them to take root, then they become, we have depressive and anxiety uh, uh, issues. Anti-ants, there is no evidence to support those uh, automatic negative thoughts, but they come to everybody. Alright? We've got to be able to get rid of them. Okay, these are some of the things that are harmful for a brain. So that's gives you a healthy brain. Obviously things, drugs and alcohol, Obesity is not good for the brain because it slows the blood flow to the brain. Smoking, obviously, the same thing. Diabetes is not good for the brain. Sad, standard American diet. Um, you, you know, it's fried food and that sort of stuff and sweets and that, everything. Um, that's what they call it. High blood pressure um, is not good. And high blood pressure and diabetes and obesity are first cousins. All right? If you've got one of them, you generally got the other two. Um, you've got uh, ants, automatic negative thoughts. Uh, got to get rid of those, they're harmful to the brain and obviously brain injuries. It's riding a lime scooter without a helmet. All right? That's going to injure your brain. So don't do that, we do that, we're going to have a healthy brain and we'll be able to draw upon all of the, all of the benefits of that brain. Um, so these are just some quick, some quick examples. Setting the brain. This is Christ talking to his apostles, John 14. Greater things that you've seen me do, do shall ye do also. What was he saying to the apostles? He said, you think I've done great things? You guys can do greater things. What's he trying to do there? He's trying to change their reality. He's trying to change their mind, set a new reality for them. Because he knows he's going to be gone, and they're going to have to run the church by, by themselves. And he knows the stress and pressure that's going to bring. He's giving them a new reality. He's not telling them a lie. He's giving them a new reality to see what they can do, what what they what the, 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 the abilities that they can that they have. Um, uh, the people of Ammon, you know, they join the church, and then the Amalekites come down to kill a thousand of them, and they still remain active. Not only did they remain active for that one generation, they remain active for the entire um, history of the Ammonite people, right? Because their mind is set. Boom! This is it. The Lamanites go this way, the Nephites start falling away, where's the Ammonites? Pew! Straight. Mindset. Ain't going to change. And their behavior is reflective of what their mindset is. Their mindset is, this is the gospel, this is the truth, we're going this way, we don't do what anybody else is doing. Um, firm and steadfast. Um, Christ talks about we, should, we have to have the law written in our minds and in our hearts. Again, referring to the mindset and the heart working together. There's lots of clues in the scriptures of what this is all about, okay? Um, positive brain equals happiness. So we want a healthy brain, which is a positive brain, and that why we want that also is because happiness doesn't come from working hard and having success. Happiness comes from having a positive brain. All right, let me give you an example. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in Vanuatu, and I'm in a village, poor village. They don't have anything, all right? I see these kids, they find a little Coca-Cola plastic top. What do they do with it? Put it on the ground, they start playing soccer with a top. And the kids are having fun. They're laughing and they're, and they're just having a great time. They're just loving it. They're having positive, they're happy. And I was thinking, if I brought a bunch of Western kids and stuck them in there and gave them a top, what would they do? They'll be saying, where's the bottle with the Coke in it? Uh, that's what they'll be saying. They'll be tossing that in the rubbish. They will be unhappy. All right? Mindset. They, 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 they don't see the poverty around them as being uh, a, a need to be unhappy. That's their mindset. We bring in unhappiness <laughs> by teaching, oh, you've got to have that, you've got to have that, that'll make you happy. All right? So having a, having a positive brain leads to happiness. Okay? We're taught that if you work hard, 
and you're successful, success will bring happiness. Well, how many people do we know that are working hard and being successful and are not happy? There's lots of people, lots of people, absolutely. So that is not a true statement, yet it is what was preached among, uh, to, to everybody. Work hard, have success, you'll be happy. Okay, this is what it is. Um, uh, when you have a positive brain, it leads to this, this hormone called uh, dopamine flooding from the brain. Dopamine, as it says, is, is a neuro, neurotransmitter. And what it does is it opens up the, the creative and learning parts of your brain. So a creative person is a person whose brain is filled with dopamine. All right? And, and that comes about by having a positive brain. If you've got a negative brain and you're thinking you're negative, that means people who are suffering from stress and depression and so forth, they will have low dopamine levels. Right? You can't get injections for that. That comes from here. So what are you going to do? You've got to change that to get that. You, don't, you can't get that from a doctor. All right? um, and that's what God's talking about. Reaction? It's, 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 just, it's a neurological hormone. It's like insulin that our pancreas produces. Our body produces all sorts of things. And we're going to talk about oxytocin and serotonin. All of these things are all produced naturally by the body. And they're there, they're there for an important purpose. And this one has to open our creativity and learning. I believe dopamine is increased with physical activity. Absolutely it is. It is increased with physical activity. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and that's why people are alert. You know, uh, as, as when, they, when they exercise or after they've exercised, they're alert. And uh, it's a great time. I find when I'm running or walking, I hear a lot of thoughts coming into my head. Lots of things about all sorts of things. New ideas and forth that I'm working on. Oh, that's a great idea. Because your brain is active and it dop dopamine is active and all these things occur. Okay. Um, let me just... Where else? Okay. So the secret to happiness is having a positive brain. That equals happiness. If you're happy, then you're successful. Whether it's whether you've got money in the bank or not, it's irrelevant. Success comes because you're happy. Okay? And you define what your success is. Um, this guy, Sean Accor, said he's a he's a happiness psychologist. He says that you can rewire your brain in 21 days. And you you will you this this is sounding very familiar. He says, gratitude journal, write down three things every day. He says what that does is that restarts your brain. Because it because when you read write read something positive, you restart your brain and your brain starts scanning for things that are positive. Okay, and then it attracts that into the brain. Okay, so um, so you, so you're positive. That's why you want to you want to read positive books or, or watch positive programs and so forth. The news is the worst thing to do. You start reading the news on the, as soon as you wake up, you're going to have a bad day because your your brain has been filled with negativity. Okay, um, unless you re rejig it. Um, exercise obviously is another one. Um, meditation, random acts of kindness and volunteer work. Remember that the Lord says, lose yourself and you will find yourself. This is all doctrinally based. But these are scientists who are not members of the church. Okay? All doctrinally based. Um, and so, again, very simple. That's how you rewire your brain. 21 days do that. And you rewire and you can have a your brain become more happy. More happy, be more, happy, more, more positive, you become more happy. And success is as you define it to be. Um, hard hearts. They went through a lot of trials and tribulations. Why? Because of the hardness of their hearts. So clearly they, they didn't have a positive brain and that affected the heart and they, could never, they couldn't respond then to the environmental changes that were occurring around them and they were suffering. Okay? Because they didn't, weren't able to naturally respond to it because this was out of, out of, out of kilter. You need to get that right. Um, other ways to maintain a healthy brain. I've already gone through that. Now, the beauty is, look at this, look at this, hey? and this is the society which we live in today, unfortunately, um, is that we seek the, the, the answers to all of our malaise through pills and surgery. Um, not everybody, but that seems to be the, the thought. When in fact, probably the answers to many of our, our issues are right here. Just adjusting our behaviour, adjusting our brain, adjusting our heart, and things will come, will come back into order and we'll no longer have the... Uh, physiological um, uh, uh, issues that, we, that, we're, that we're having. God created us, and He said when He created us that we were very good. Alright? 
And so this is the very good line. He didn't he didn't create us with a with a pharmacy to go to when we were sick, right? He gave us the fruits and the flowers and everything else. That was our pharmacy, all right? The earth that we live in. Um, here we go. That's the pharmacy. Uh, and we have this thing called the word of wisdom. The beauty about the word of wisdom is oops, straight back one. The beauty about the word of wisdom is that the brethren are reluctant to add any definition of what's said in the Revelation. You will not find hardly anything written by the brethren which further defines what the word of wisdom is about. Um, and that's because this is for you and I to understand and for you and I to define. Now there are many members in the church who have their own definitions of what the word of wisdom actually means and they will preach that in Sunday school um, but that is not the brethren, okay? You read that you draw your own conclusions and you live and you apply that in your life. And you'll see wholesome plants, protein, herbs and fruits, vitamins and minerals, meats, protein, grains, carbohydrates, and the promises of, well, of wisdom, physical activity, wisdom, good brain, positive brain, physical activity, good body to, to, to move around, temporal spiritual protection. Um, um, we, we focus on the thou shalt nots. When we pass the temple recommend by doing the thou shalt nots, we forget that this is also part of the word of wisdom, and it's also part of the temple uh, interview, the thou shalts. What are you doing? What are you eating? That's a part of it. But we always go, oh, I'm not smoking, drinking drugs. Yep, I'm good. But we forget this part here. But this is the most, this is the critical part. Okay? If we're going to have all those things lined up. This is just a, 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 a visual of, of what we've just gone through. Lots of colour. Um, I work at the MTC, I'm a counsellor in the MTC in Auckland, and when I see the, see the missionaries in the MTC, the young missionaries with their plates getting their food, mm -hmm. I look at their plates and go, hey elder or sister, there's not much colour on that plate. It's mostly brown and brown and white. It's mostly this. Mostly this. Me and this. None of no colours. I says, elders, you've got to have colours. You've got to have colours in your food. Oh, I don't want to. <laughs> da -da -da -da. Smart food, smart brain. That's what you've got to do. You know, you've got to work on that. Hippocrates, Greek, he's called the father of modern day medicine. He said, let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. Again, I think God would say the same thing. I created the pharmacy, it's all around you. That's what you've got to do. I hope we're say the same thing. Um, stress. Oh, this is, a, this is a good one. This is interesting. Is stress all that bad? Uh, this, this is interesting. Um, I'm going to show you a little clip soon. But in this clip, you won't, you won't, she won't say this, but um, she talks, they did, a, they, did a, um, they, they did an experiment. 30,000 people, they, they, they traced uh, over eight years, interviewed 30,000 people, asked them the question, um, how many of you suffer from high stress? And they obviously recorded the numbers. How many of you, and, and then low stress, and blah, blah, blah. how many of you that suffer from high stress believe that stress is bad for your health? Then they recorded all of that. How many of you suffer from high stress and believe that stress is not bad for your health? Recorded all that. And then what they did after those eight years is that they then watched the death columns in the newspapers and they began to match up names with the names on their 30,000 database list and they started finding out who was dying. They found that those who had high stress and believed that stress was bad for their health had 43% more chance of dying than those who had high stress but didn't think stress was bad for their health. In fact, those who had high stress and didn't think stress was bad for their health had lower rates of death than those who had low stress. So the only thing that was killing them was that they thought stress would kill you. It wasn't stress that killed them. It was the thought, the brain saying, this is the outcome, early death for you. People were dying because they were thinking that stress was going to kill them. Interesting. Yeah, um, let's just, listen, let's just, uh, well, we shall go back to this. And let's listen to this Dr. Kathy McGonagall or something like that. Can you get her name? But we are going to do one more intervention. 
I want to tell you about one of the most underappreciated aspects of the stress response. And the idea is this. Stress makes you social. To understand the side of stress, we need to talk about a hormone, oxytocin. And I know, oxytocin has already gotten as much hype as a hormone can get. It even has its own cute nickname, the cuddle hormone, because it's released when you hug someone. But this is a very small part of what oxytocin is involved in. Oxytocin is a neurohormone. It fine-tunes your brain's social instincts. It primes you to do things that strengthen close relationships. Oxytocin makes you crave physical contact with your friends and family. It enhances your empathy. It even makes you more willing to help and support the people you care about. Some people have even suggested we should snort oxytocin to become more compassionate and caring. But here's what most people don't understand about oxytocin. It's a stress hormone. Your pituitary gland pumps this stuff out as part of the stress response. It's as much a part of your stress response as the adrenaline that makes your heart pound. And when oxytocin is released in the stress response, it is motivating you to seek support. Your biological stress response is nudging you to tell someone how you feel instead of bottling it up. Your stress response wants to make sure you notice when someone else in your life is struggling so that you can support each other. When life is difficult, your stress response wants you to be surrounded by people who care about you. Okay, so how is knowing this side of stress going to make you healthier? Well, oxytocin doesn't only act on your brain, it also acts on your body. And one of its main roles in your body is to protect your cardiovascular system from the effects of stress. It's a natural anti-inflammatory. It also helps your blood vessels stay relaxed during stress. But my favorite effect on the body is actually on the heart. Your heart has receptors for this hormone. And oxytocin helps heart cells regenerate and heal from any stress-induced damage. This stress hormone strengthens your heart. And the cool thing is, is that all of these physical benefits of oxytocin are enhanced by social contact and social support. So when you reach out to others under stress, either to seek support or to help someone else, you release more of this hormone, your stress response becomes healthier, and you actually recover faster from stress. I find this amazing that your stress response has a built-in mechanism for stress resilience. And that mechanism is human connection. Nice, isn't it? Mm -hmm. No problem with this way. But we are going to do one... So, you think all of this is by accident. God knew this. And he's put all of this stuff in us. And we've got the ability to deal with all of these things. Oxytocin. Is it any wonder why one of the most important things that God wants us to do is serve one another? It's, it's not so much that we can count... It's so that we can have these oxytocin moments in our own lives and strengthen ourselves as well as, as a byproduct, strengthening other people. Um, it, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. So let me just um, move quickly to, to the closing here. Um, resilience, stress, and so forth. Um, I like this. Alma, Alma the Younger, Alma 36. And he's talking, about, he's talking about his conversion process. He's telling his son about it. And he says, For three days and three nights was I racked even with the pains of a damned soul. And it came to pass as I was thus racked with torment while I was harrowed up by the memory of my many sins. I cried within my... I, I remembered also to have heard my father preach to the people concerning uh, the coming of one Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to atone for the sins of the world. And when my mind caught hold upon this thought, I cried within my heart. When my mind caught hold of the book, I cried in my heart, O oh, Jesus, our Son of God, have mercy upon me, whom in the gall of bitterness shall encircle about by the everlasting chains of death. When I had thought this, I could remember my pains no more. Yea, I was harried by the memory of my sins no more. And I would draw up marvelous light that I behold. Yea, my soul was filled with joy, exceeding as was my pain. I say to you, my son, there could be nothing so exquisite and so bitter as was my pain. 
And I said to you again, my son, on the other end, there could be nothing so exquisite, so sweet, as was my joy. Do you see? Heart, mind, and soul, all in that whole thing. Did his pain actually go away, or did his mindset change, and he could no longer feel it, because he was expecting a different outcome? I think the latter. Because God uses what he has here to resolve our issues, rather than necessarily clicking his fingers and making something happen. Let's look at Joseph Smith. He's going to Carthage. He knows he's going to die. There's no question about it. What's his, what's his comment? I am going like a lamb to the slaughter, but I am calm. Confidence. Resilience. As a summer's day, um, a summer's morning, I have a conscience void of offense towards God and towards all men. He did not hate the guys who were taking him. He did not hate God for the situation that he finds himself in. How could he be in that position facing that sort of stress? Mind, heart, soul, boom. Love God with all of that. Um, I, it doesn't stress me. It doesn't worry me anymore. I'm free of that. Let's look at the greatest, the Savior. Um, he's on the cross, suffering. He's had been through Gethsemane. Looks down and he says, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. So even at his, a moment of extreme pain, his thoughts were outward, thinking, who could he serve? <clears throat> These Roman soldiers, Father, forgive them. They didn't know what they were doing. Uh, then he sees his mother, and he says, John, behold us thy mother. Again, despite his own pain, what he, all he could see was his, mo his mother crying, and that she needed comfort and asked John to be the comforter. And then when he was arrested and Peter sliced off the ear of the arresting officer, Malchus, what does Christ do? Instead of caring about his own pain and his own journey, he heals Malchus' ear looking outward. You see, that's the power of oxytocin. I'm not saying that that was operating at the time of Jesus Christ, but that's the power of oxytocin. When we start to look outside, we allow we don't allow the stressful situation to look us to help us look inside. We look outside because it forces us to look for people to help um, and, and and to accommodate. And don't let me get on the joke. What he went through. These are perfect examples of people in high stress situations who were able to deal with the great and spacious building by utilizing the tools which God has given us, and the power of God gave them the confidence to deal with the stress before them. Think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walking to the furnace. And I'm confident as I read the scriptures, they weren't going, ah. They went to the furnace, not knowing that they were going to be saved. Boom, oxytocin. All the things that were going on in their body. And God saved them. They didn't know that. But their mindset was, God look after us, whatever that might be. And it didn't stress them. That is what we have today to deal with the stressful situations that we live in. And I testify that these things that science are discovering are in harmony with what religion has been teaching for thousands and thousands of years. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Amen. Amen.